Okay, zoning versus discretion, discretionary planning system. Uh, in Britain, currently, every single piece of land that's going to be developed needs to have planning permission applied for and agreed to for it. In a zoning system, different bits of land are allocated to different uses, and provided that the development fits within the allocated use, it can go ahead with minimal oversight. Um, so it's a way of speeding up development. It doesn't have to jump through the various planning hoops. And it also depoliticizes it, because when planning permission is granted, it's made by planning committees of councils who are heavily influenced by their local constituents. It's very prone to kind of nimbious type pressures, essentially. Um, so that's the system that they have in the Netherlands and also in Germany. Um, I also mentioned the alignment of the interest of decision makers and economic incentives. Uh, there's a number of factors here. So in a key one, I think, in Germany, grants are from the central government or from the federal government are allocated to local government on the basis of the number of inhabitants. So there's a financial incentive to enlarge the number of people living in your borough. Whereas in the UK, it's often up to the councils to extract some kind of financial benefit from the developers themselves through Section 106 agreements and so on. Um, is that sufficient? Yes, thank you. Just on the of course. We've got the zoning system. Would this still be build and control? Yeah, I mean, you can. It, different areas are allocated for different uses, and you can stipulate certain restrictions on the kinds of developments that take place. I didn't mean that, because I've been mean about the building, and you have that building control officer who come round and make sure that, for instance, the footings are a certain depth. No, that they would still be necessary. Because that building control is a young area. Yeah, I mean, you're already on a kind of greater level of detail than I've ever been involved in. But I, yeah. I mean, these are different, these are kind of health and safety regulations that buildings need yeah. to meet. Yeah. Is that the kind yeah. of thing? Yeah. No, for the most part, actually, that it's actually going to be case where uh, all the buildings would have to be uh, forty four already, meaning forty four percent uh, energy efficient, and that's actually European wide. It's going to go for code five, code six. That's okay. Thank you. We minimise the technical questions. Right. Right. I think we've covered as much as we can there. Now you say that. Is there anything else you want to come back on there? Yeah. Uh, yeah there's a couple of so the bubble. Um, Empty properties in London, I think, were the three other things. Mm. I'll try and be really quick. London differences, absolutely, um, which is evident in house prices now. Right? I still think it's worth emphasising that it's a different of degree rather than kind at the moment. And an illustration of this, I think, so year-on-year -year house price increases from March were, I think, 8 or 9% nationally. If you unpick this, it was 18% in London, 4.7% in the rest of the country. Now, 18% is astronomical, but 4% compared to other countries who experienced a housing boom in the early 2000s and a crash after the financial crisis is also very high. If you look in Spain, Ireland, as I mentioned before, house prices are still kind of 40% below what they were at their, their pre-crisis peak and haven't started growing again. So this kind of, the problems of supply shortages and affordability do exist outside of London. The, the, kind of the structures through which housing are provided are the same and these problems are present elsewhere to a much lesser degree. Um, and arguably, the, in, arguably in some places such as Northern Ireland, not at all, but I think well, it shouldn't be ignored. The difference between London and the rest of the country can be exaggerated. Um, empty properties is definitely a problem. I think there's probably not enough information about who these, like, why these properties are empty, which ones they are, and so on. Um, I think a big part of it is second homes, or as equal, uh, another significant problem is underpopulation of properties or not using them extensively. But in terms of kind of practical policy programmes, I think it would be much easier to build new housing, especially on land, for example, that the council owns already, than it would be to force people 
to vacate the house that they belong to, they feel an attachment to, because they're not using all of the rooms. You know, in terms of what is more realistic, if we actually want to house people more adequately, I think that trying to force people to take in lodges to fill up rooms or to move downsize to a smaller house is much more kind of going to be much more of an affront to the middle classes than building new housing. Is. I mean, that's a matter of debate, but I, I think it's quite unrealistic, and yeah, I'm happy to be dogmatic about this, isn't it? Yeah, empty properties. I mean, depending on ownership, I think there's a similar problem. Can you, if they're simply defunct and no one's using them, then I would straightforwardly say they should just be reclaimed and used to house people. But often I think it's more complicated. Thanks, my Housing bubble, okay. very quickly. Um, I think it's tricky because, as I've said repeatedly, I think there is a structural shortage of housing, um, which implies that it's not a bubble, except that it's complicated by the fact that most people's access to housing goes via the financial sector. So you get the fin dependence of access in the house via the financial sector given our access to housing these bubble-like qualities, even when we have a structural supply shortage, which suggests that house prices are a reflection of the shortage of housing rather than simply being a bubble, purely in a kind of expectation, speculative bubble. Um, yeah, so I'm not anticipating any... I mean... Remind me of exactly what you wanted to know. Well, the people at the moment, the media and others, yeah. are concerned talking about the housing bubble, which is what happened before 2007 came. And they're speculating that it's going again out of control, the government's keen to get the yeah. housing bubble, and that it will burst again. And my question is, do you agree with this? Do you think it will? And what do you think the impact on the economy will be with the bubble? Hmm. Okay, so I think there was a bubble pre-2007, pre and it did burst, but again, to emphasise this, comparison with other countries with otherwise similar housing systems, it was it burst to a much lesser degree. Yeah. Prices bottomed out after a fall of about 11%, and now, as we've seen, they're rising again throughout the country. Very different to Spain, Ireland, where I think you had much, straight, much more straightforwardly what you saw up until 2000 was the speculative housing bubble. I think until the problem of housing supply is going to be addressed, you will have this kind of minor filling up of a bubble, so house price increases and crash, led by the financial sector, so it depends on the availability of finance or not, but house prices are going to stay high until the supply problem is dealt with. So we'll get a similar kind of asymmetrical bubble, essentially, where it doesn't burst that far. When it bursts, it doesn't. Prices don't sink that much because of the structural supply shortage. That's my view. Yeah, just a couple of things. So they're mainly um, go from there. But um, I can't deal with them all because it's quite a lot and varied. But a couple of things I want to pick out. Um, one on neoliberalism, um, because neoliberalism um, is essentially, you know, the idea that if government gets out of the way of markets, everything will be fine. But the problem in terms of the economy is interference by the state. And oddly enough, <laughs> um, all these answers keep coming back to what are supposed to be different problems. Because if you remember, if you cut them for those of you old enough to have been around and bear the scars, um, the problem identified by Thatcher and Reagan and was inflation, not debt. Yet, apparently, miraculously, um, the solution is just the same um, as it was with the ER, or Britain's membership of the ERM. That is um, union busting, privatisation, deregulation, etc., etc. So it's always the same solution, even though the problem is identified as a very different one. And that's because all those things have the effect of uh, driving up profits. So, bust unions, you get low pay, privatised, that's a whole new area like health, for example, that you can make private sector profits in, and so on. Um, you see regulation, well, you know, who needs health and safety doesn't really matter, people die at work and so on. Um, so, it's always the same answer, even though the, 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 um, um, the supposed crisis is very different. 
if it worked, we wouldn't have been in this mess. It wasn't um, the US government which went bust, it was layman's. Um, it wasn't um, the US government that went bust, it was General Motors that went bust. It was, in this country, it was the banks. It was the private sector that failed, not the public sector that failed. And it's still the case. Anything that happens, anything positive that happens, or actually in some cases negative, Mary's mentioned the health of buy, but that's, that's putting some money in the housing market. You know, we could do it very differently. We could have a health to build. We could have £40 billion pounds, uh, where we guarantee local authorities to build new housing for example. But everything that's happening is happening because the state intervenes. Uh, it's not happening because the private sector intervenes. We have a ridiculous situation where the argument for uh, the private sector is they take risks. But we're having a situation now where the, the state, i.e. the government, is guaranteeing profits for the nuclear industry hmm. um, so that they will build new nuclear power uh, stations in this country. Well, that's what that's allegedly what the private sector is supposed to be get its money for, is for taking risks. Um, so the whole purpose of, of this is to, is, to, is to boost profits. And I don't believe there's a golden age in this country. But I do note that in the period when union membership was double what it is now, when the NHS wasn't being privatised, when, you know, and so on and so on, uh, i.e. pre-Reagan and Thatcher. Growth rates were much stronger, um, so it's not true at all um, that this has worked, and it's not going to work as a result. So we can be confident that, that this whole round of <coughs> further erosion of union rights, further privatisation, is not going to work because we've been there. It's not, it's not, not a sort of forecast, it's just a continuation of what we've had before. In terms of... Um, of um, question of Britain's imperial past and its current imperial status. Uh, Richard said I'm too modest to mention a past I've heard recently on the list, but I'm not. Because um, uh, it took me a bloody long time to write <laughs> it. Um, so it, uh, if you're interested in why I think it's a very, very long and involved um, topic, but I've written that as sort of the penultimate thing I've written on social and economic policy. But what I will say is this, is that um, Back 100 years ago, um, at the outset of the First World War, when there was a sort of scientific value attached to the term imperialism, which had been bandied around for a while, um, it was already the case that Britain, in particular, was starting to be a decaying and decrepit economy relative to sort of more vigorous uh, capitalist economies like the United States, for a whole variety of reasons, I don't have time to go into it now, but um, it's essentially when you act like a parasite in the rest of the world, you become somewhat feeble after a period, you don't grow, you don't invest in your own economy and so on and so on. And that's carried on for a hundred years. Um, so um, the sort of feebleness and decay and decrepitude <laughs> has carried on. And basically, the argument of our enemies is that the people who've done that for a hundred years or more should carry on doing it. Um, that everything's going to be right with the world if the Etonians run Britain. They've been running it and they've run it into the ground. And they're going to carry on doing it, I have no doubt about that, because you know we're not going to transform the entire system. Um, but we should be clear that what they do it doesn't work for the overwhelming majority of the population. Uh, and they used to be able to exploit vast swathes of the rest of the world, uh, and they used to be able to do it militarily. That's starting to change a bit. Starting to change a bit. They've become so enfeebled, but you know it hasn't ended. Uh, that period hasn't ended by by a long stretch of you know wars in Iraq and attempts to bomb Syria and all the rest of it. It's perfectly fine. Great, thank you. Oh, I've got sixty people who want to. Questions. Any other people who haven't indicated yet? We've got a lot of guys. Maximum guys.